Okay, hi everyone. Thank you if you have been waiting for my tech issues to be resolved. Thank you for your patience. I'm Lara. I'm a freelance editor. I edit fiction and comics and some nonfiction too. And I am so excited to bring Story Cadet to you. Story Cadet is a workshop that is online. It's kind of like an online there's a motorcycle right outside, if you can hear it. It's kind of like a conference, but it's also kind of like a writing course. So there are different options, and I'll talk about that at the end. But first, I really want to get into this webinar. It is self-publishing versus traditional publishing, the pros and cons of each so if you have any questions, go ahead and tweet them to Story Cadet, or you can ask the questions in the YouTube video chat opening, <laughs> and um, I will answer those questions at the end if you've got any. And if you don't, then maybe I'll see you next time. Okay, so let's get started. This is still all very new to me, so we are learning together. Okay, so this is the first lesson of the cadet course, and the cadet course is all about pitching and submitting your work to either agents or readers if you're a self-publisher. So lesson one, we're going to talk about self-publishing or traditional. Lesson two is about understanding age categories and genres. That might be my favorite lesson. We're also going to be live tweeting movies after that lesson. But I'm just going to skip ahead and we'll get back to this. So the real question between self-publishing and traditional is which route you will choose for each book. You really only want to choose one route. You don't want to say, oh, well, I'm going to self-publish to see if people are interested in it, and then I'm going to go approach agents with my self-published book. You don't do that. It's been done before, but we'll get to that at the end. And if you're wanting to do traditionally published work, you don't see self-publishing as just your plan B. They're totally different options, and we're going to talk about those in this lesson. Okay, so the main difference is that self-publishing is about control, and it costs money. The main thing about traditional publishing is that it's about collaboration and it takes time. So just from thinking about those pros and cons right there, you might already have an idea of what your personality would like more. If you really like control and you want to have your hands in everything, you might want to do self-publishing, but you also have to be able to front up all of that cash for the investment that it's going to be. But if you do traditional publishing, you lose a little bit of your control because you're collaborating with a bunch of other people and it takes a lot of time. We're gonna start with money first. So self-publishing costs several thousand dollars to put your team together. You're gonna to have editors, proofreaders, designers, a layout person that's going to do the internal typesetting. You're gonna have a marketing team and you might even choose a publisher or you might just do print on demand through a company like Amazon CreateSpace. Approximately $5,000 is what most self-publishers pay to put out their book and that is pretty conservative. So if you want to do self-publishing, you want to budget about $5,000 at least. And I'll just tell you right now, a good editing job is going to cost at least 20% of that. For traditional publishing, you actually get paid an advance often, especially with the bigger publishers. They average five to $10,000. So even though on the news you might hear about 
these huge six and seven figure deals, that's really not the norm. The norm is about $10,000 that you're paid before your book comes out. And then after your book earns that back, you'll start to get royalties per copy that's sold. So if you get a smaller advance, you're going to get more in royalties. If you get a bigger advance, it's going to take a long time for you to be able to get royalties because it's going to take a while for that many books to sell that you actually pay back the publisher in a sense. A self-publishing contract will earn you a bigger percentage per book because you might be giving some percentage off to your publisher, but you'll take a bigger chunk per book. And traditional publishing earns a small percentage per book since the team is paid out of your profits. So the whole publisher is going to be taking a pretty big chunk per book. Self-publishers pay for marketing or they do it all themselves. Traditional publishers will handle about 40 to 60 percent of marketing. That comes from agent Mandy Hubbard. She gave me that percentage. So, so it's you can just kind of guess that your traditional publisher will handle half of your marketing. They're not going to do it all for you. So you still do have to do a lot of your own marketing. You have to build an email list or have all of your friends buy your book and many more than that you're gonna have to go to events that sort of thing so no matter which one you choose you're gonna be marketing your book so don't think that that's gonna really change if you do traditional publishing so as an overview self-publishing is being a small business owner you're basically going to hire all of the people that are working for you and you're gonna pay them for it Traditional publishing will get your books out to more readers, but you still need to market your book. And you're not paying anything for traditional publishing. If it's traditional publishing, you are not paying a dime. You are actually getting paid. We will get into vanity and subsidy publishers and publishing services at the end of this lesson. But traditional publishing, you don't pay for. You don't pay for an agent and you don't pay for a publisher. Just want to make that clear. Okay, so relationships is also where we'll look at the pros and cons of each. With self-publishing, since you're investing in yourself, you make the decisions and you hire the production team. You can vet everybody that you want to work with. If you get a designer that you don't like, you can fire them. You'll still have to pay them for the work that they did, but you can hire somebody else. You pay designers, editors, formatters, and publicists to work for you, and you pay each person out of pocket before your book goes to print. For each book, you'll need to pay your team to get it ready to print. So every single book that you create is another five to ten thousand dollars that you're paying before your book even gets out there. You pay everyone but the reader. The reader should pay you. But if you're selling for free on Amazon just to get downloads, you're not even getting paid by the reader. So if, you're, if you have a lot of savings or if you have a nice chunk of savings, then self-publishing can be a really great idea. But if you are wanting to spend no money on publishing your book, you're not going to be able to self-publish. In traditional publishing, you work in partnership with agents and editors. They aren't paid unless your book is successful. You might hire a freelance editor before getting an agent. I'm a freelance editor, so I actually get paid by clients. I'm not an agent, and I'm not an acquisitions editor. I just help them polish up their book before they send it out. And it's up to the publisher how much you get paid and how many of your books they'll publish. So they aren't under really any contract to publish any more of your books besides the one that they decide to publish. You might get a two or three book deal, but they don't have to publish anything for you. It's their decision. It's not yours, basically. You have to work with those people and they have to agree to publish your book. And again, you do not pay agents or publishers. 
Okay, time. Self-publishing, you can publish on your own timeline because you are the boss. You'll have to allow enough time for the editors, designers, and formatters to get your manuscript ready for print or ebooks. Allow a lot of time, folks. If you have a first draft and you get it polished up by yourself, it's still going to take a few months for everyone on the team to get everything ready from your polished draft to a copy edited final draft to a proofread book to, well, even before proofreading, you have to get it laid out and then you have to get a cover and you have to make sure that it all fits together. It just takes a lot of time. Remember how long it took you to write your book? It's going to take a long time to edit your book too. So that will take the most time, but you still need to allow plenty of time for your designers and formatters. So plan ahead and research your team and get quotes on price as well as turnaround time. If you have a deadline that's already set before you come to an editor or a designer, they may charge you a rush fee. Since you're the publisher, you might not have as much time to write or revise because you'll be running your business. So because you'll have to spend a lot of time, you'll do 100% of your marketing or you'll hire a marketer and you will be hiring all of these people. You will be doing publicity. You're not going to have as much time to write and revise. And that's one of the reasons why publishing why self-publishing gets a bad rap because a lot of self-publishers don't allow enough time for edits and good design or they don't allow enough money for good edits and good design. And if you want to do self-publishing and you want to do it well, you have to know that it's running your own business. With traditional, you'll pitch the book to an agent. If you are in the pitching stage, you know that that can take months to years. It could happen in as little as like a week, but you have to have a great book. It has to be polished and you have to get a yes from an agent. It's kind of like dating and finding someone that wants to marry you. It's a contract. You hope that it's lifelong for your whole career. It takes a lot of time to get an agent. And that's just step one. Step two, your agent pitches the book to an editor and they don't just pick to one they don't just pitch to one editor, they pitch to a lot of editors. They have connections, they know what editors want, and they will pitch your book to all of those editors. They'll talk it up, they'll say why your book needs to be published. Then if the editor says yes, they have to pitch the book to the publisher. And the publisher isn't just like one guy sitting in an office, it's a whole marketing team, it's a lot of people, and they all have to agree that they want to put the book forward. So even if your editor says yes, you might still get a no from your publisher. And then the publisher pitches the books to book buyers. Before they say yes, they might go out and talk to book distributors and the people that understand the trends and the market and they'll see if it's a viable book. This doesn't always happen with small presses and we'll get into that at the end. Indie presses, don't always go through all of these steps. But for big five traditional publishers, you're going to go through a lot of steps, and each of those steps takes a long time. So your job is to write, and that's what you'll spend most of your time doing, writing and revising. But a lot of your time will also be waiting for others to say yes. And you'll still spend time marketing your book. So my advice is while you're waiting for those yeses, just keep writing and revising. Write more books and spend your time doing that. Don't spend your time twiddling your thumbs or freaking out. Um, just keep writing. Okay, so that's pretty much the differences. And we're going to get into some questions and answers. But first, I want to tell you that some publishers don't require agents and they are open to submissions. If you don't have an agent, you really, really, really need to hire a lawyer to look over your contracts. There are lawyers that specialize in creative clients, so you really want to get a lawyer 
to look over your contract to make sure that you're not entering into some scary deal. If you have an agent, your agent will look at the contract and good agents or new agents from good agencies will know what good and bad contracts look like. There are some agents that refuse to work with certain publishers because they are small presses that have horrible contracts. Some even big publishers have horrible contracts and your agent will negotiate that. So if you don't have an agent, you need a lawyer to represent you. You don't want to be thrown under the bus. So there is a post from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America about vanity presses and I'm just going to talk about it here because we have time. So I have part of an assignment, find a boutique publisher. Is it really a vanity press? Would you consider paying for their services? Just ignore that for now. We're going to talk about it right now. Okay, vanity subsidy presses charge the author to publish his or her book under their name. So the SFWA says cost for vanity slash subsidy publishing can rise into the high five figure range. Vanity and subsidy presses, just they charge you money to publish your book. Self-publishing services offer editing, marketing, distribution, or design packages, which you choose from. So publishing is, is also a service. It's not just a business that produces books. Publishing is also a service. So there are, sometimes they call themselves boutique publishers or boutique distributors. They use the word boutique a lot, um, but they offer maybe editing or marketing or design packages along with their distribution. So self-publishing services are basically there to help you out if you're a self-publisher by giving you a menu that you can choose from. So instead of you going and ordering a la carte from seven different restaurants, they have one menu at their one restaurant and you can order whatever you want off their menu. But they'll have choices. You might be limited to what they'll allow. So they might have like two or three designers that you can choose from, or they might have one editing package that you can choose from. So basically, either way, with vanity presses or self-publishing services, you need to talk to their clients and you need to research them and see if they're reputable and see if the, if the editors or designers actually are putting out good work, see if the marketers actually know what they're doing and are getting a lot of book sales, see if the distribution is out in bookstores or if it's just mailed to your house, and see what kind of printing they're doing. It's all about research. And the same goes for self for small presses. Small presses are traditional publishers, so you don't pay them. They don't make any money unless your book makes money. Small presses usually fall into two different camps. So there's the literary small press, and those are usually run by academics. They're the people that went to school for literature, they have their MFAs, and um, they want to put out new literary voices that will win awards. They want to share unique, diverse voices, and they want to share their stories. So some small presses are, well, Grey Wolf, and I say that because I'm in Minnesota, but they have won a lot of national book awards. And there's also um, Coffee House Press. There's a lot of small presses that are totally reputable that are on the literary side. There's also commercial small presses. Some of these are ebook distributors. Some of them are imprints of bigger traditional publishers. Sometimes they are a press that's run by commercial writers that don't have any experience editing or designing or marketing. They're just a couple writers and their buddies who wanted to call themselves editors and wanted to print other people's books as well as their own. So you have to look out for those people. There are a lot of commercial small presses that are super reputable and they make great sales and they have really great readers that are loyal to them. 
So what you need to do with these commercial small presses and the literary small presses too, anybody can call themselves a press. You need to research and look at their contracts with a lawyer or an agent and you need to see if they are on the Writer we Beware website or if they're on the Absolute Right website. The um, It's the Absolute Right water cooler. See if people are talking smack about these presses because if they are, you don't want to work with them. This is the one case where gossip can actually benefit you. You don't want to work with someone who has ripped off writers. So do your research. Again, if you have an agent and it's and you've done your research with finding your agent, then your agent will do that, but you can't you you'll be doing research. You'll either research your agent and then you'll trust your agent to not get you in a crummy deal because if you're in a crummy deal, they're in a crummy deal because they don't get paid unless you get paid. But if you're a self-publisher or if you are trying to find a publisher without an agent, you also have to do the research. And one last note, the term boutique publisher, I've heard it thrown around for all three of those categories. Um, it just means that they offer something more than merely distribution. The science fiction and, and fantasy writers of America kind of go into more difference between the vanity subsidy presses and the self-publishing services. Actually, when I first started creating this lesson, they didn't have a difference between the two, but I think enough people showed them that there are legitimate self-publishing services or boutique places that will do a good job and take care of their clients and the writers. But the vanity and subsidy presses are the ones that have really sketchy contracts and they are just out to take your money. And sfwa.org has a lot of horror stories that you can learn from and just be terrified by. So great nighttime reading. I might not read it right before bed, just saying. Okay, so what are some self published books which eventually got traditional book deals. You'll notice that I'm asking myself these questions. I will get to any other questions at the end of this lesson. Um, so self-published books with which eventually got traditional book deals. Okay, so the ones that I hear about most often are The Martian, which was, has recently become a movie, and the what is it? The Rabbit Who Couldn't Go to Sleep? Okay, so these are two books that were self-published and eventually got huge traditional book deals. Now, the reason that these books got traditional book deals was because they sold hundreds of thousands of books. And not just downloads, we're talking about they're making money off of these books. If a traditional publisher sees you making hundreds of thousands of dollars or even, you know, five figures on a book and is seeing that tons of readers are really interested in it, they might want to cut in a deal with you and get a little slice of the pie. So if you're selling hundreds and thousands of copies, not just downloads, but you have a price point on your book, then you do have a chance getting a traditional book deal. If you've sold 50,000, 20,000, you might not. You, If you've sold $5,000, there's not really a chance, or 5,000 copies, there's not really a chance that you are gonna get a traditional book deal after the fact. Once it's published, it's published. So those are the exception because they sold a ton of books. And also, I haven't read The Martian yet, it's on my list, but it's a really great story. And honestly, the stories are what sell. In the case of The Rabbit That Wouldn't Go to Sleep, it was a concept that sold. And all I can say is that I hope that when it's redistributed, they use different illustrations because those freaked me out. A hybrid author is an author who self-publishes some books and traditionally publishes others. So you'll hear about hybrid publishers. And they, I'm just going to refer you to the sfwa.org for that. Um, just look up vanity publishers 
on that website again because hybrid publishers they could be really great or really scary it's it's like the word organic you can apply it to anything and it doesn't really mean anything so you need to go in and look at their contracts but a hybrid author is an author who self publishes some books and traditionally publishes others so why might you want to self publish some books but not others a lot of writers self publish writing books books about writing so chuck wendig um K.M. Wayland, I, I'm probably pronouncing their names wrong. I'm so sorry. They both self-publish their writing books. And they, I think K.M. Wayland traditionally publishes her other books. Pretty sure. I don't know. They're all on Amazon, and that's how I get them. I don't really look at the publishers all the time. But um, Chuck Wendig he talks about being a hybrid author on his blog and if you're okay with adult language go ahead and check it out it's the terrible minds blog um so he self-published a lot of writing books but now he pretty much sticks to traditionally published deals and honestly i think that's because he wants to spend more time writing and interacting with readers and less time running a self-publishing business Okay, I am going to switch really quick and see if there are any questions, if any of you have any. So, let's see here. Hi, I'm back. Okay, so let's see if you have any questions. Okay, none on Twitter. That's all right. I have, will have this live recording recorded for readers of my newsletter, The Writer Reveille. And you can find that on my website at the very bottom, laurawillard.com, L-A-R-A, -A, no you, not Laura, laurawillard.com. Okay, let's see if there are any questions. Um, laurawillard.com. Oh, no. Okay, let's see if there are any questions on YouTube. No, there are not. So I'm just going to assume that those watchers out there don't have any questions, and I'm going to move on. If you have any questions, you can just tweet me later. It's fine. Okay. Where did that page go? I don't know where, I'm at, where I am. Okay, here I am. All right, so we're going to get back into what the next lessons are going to hold for us. And my screen just went away. So we're going to go infinitely into the abyss. And we're now back where we're supposed to be. Okay, so lesson one, we just had it. It was really short. What time is it now? Okay, well, it's about half an hour. That's a pretty good time. Um, lesson two is understanding age categories and genres, and I am so excited for this. I have a list of movies for us to watch and a live tweet, so you really want to be a part of that, and honestly, I'm probably going to make it free. So as long as you are um, subscribed to The Writer Reveille, then you'll probably get the link to that because I just really want people to see it. It's going to be so fun. Lessons three to four are all about pitching your work. So in lesson three, we'll talk about genre, world, concept, and theme, and how those are important to know about your work. And especially when you're pitching it to, like if you're a graphic novelist and you want to pitch your work, you're going to need to know all of those things in your, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> you're going to need to know all of those in your pitch to publishers so you're gonna need to know them anyway but you really need to know those if you're a graphic novelist or if you're an artist if you're an artist okay lesson four is about character goals obstacles and stakes and those are especially what you need to know when it comes to writing your query letter or back cover copy but you also need to know your genre world concept and theme so We'll go into all of those. Those are pretty in-depth lessons. 
and they're just really practical. You'll go through whatever you're pitching and I hope it's going to be really eye-opening and maybe even give you ideas for future books. Okay, lesson five is the lesson of this series. It is writing the query letter or back cover copy. That is probably going to be at least an hour long. It's We're going to dive in and look at successful queries. We're going to hear from a bunch of literary agents on what works and what doesn't. Not literally hear them. I just have quoted them in the lesson. Sorry, no celebrity agents in this. But you can order the lesson five by itself if you go to storycadet.com. Story Cadet is S T O R Y C A D E T dot C O M. You can order just writing the query letter and get a query letter edit from me with like three passes. So you can order that one a la carte if you don't want to order all of the lessons. Lesson six is choosing agents or presses to query. Lesson seven is responses and rejections. If you have rejections or responses, you're going to want to bring those to lesson seven because that's going to be a lot of Q&A. Um, I'll go over a lot of questions that clients have asked me in the past and we will basically just demystify what agents are saying when they reject or respond to your query letter um, or if an editor says that too. So get ready for that one. <laughs> if you have some questions, go ahead and bring those to that lesson. It'll be a lot of just asking and answering questions. And then lesson eight, that is also free to the public, just like this one. It is an interview with Jackie Lee Summers. She's the author of Truist, which came out from Harper in 2015. It actually came out from Catherine Teigen Books, which is an imprint of Harper. And I'm going to be interviewing you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be interviewing her. And if you are one of the cadets, which means you have purchased the whole package, then you will be able to ask her the questions because I'm going to have the questions ready ahead of time. But if you pop in, we'll probably still have time for questions. Maybe. I don't know. It depends on how many questions the students, the paying students, want to ask. If they want to dominate the whole time, then they're going to do that because they get priority since they're paying for the entire course. So why would you want to pay for this entire course? Well, let me tell you, it is a workshop. So everybody that joins, we're going to skip ahead. This is the website, Story Cadet Workshop for Storytellers. So if you join, you're going to be part of the private website and forum. There is a public forum for anyone you can join it by going to storycadet.com and going to this camp button. Oh, my arrow just got really big. That was really exciting. And you can choose campsites for each age category that you write for. So go there and join the free forum. But if you join the Story Cadet courses, then you also get to be in the private forum and the private forum is where you post your assignments um, you post your query letters and we will discuss them as a class you can break out into smaller groups you can find critique partners in the class i will go in and give feedback to everyone's post and we're just gonna have a great time and if you invite your friend right now i have the deal where you save fifty dollars each on your on the package deal but i'm changing that to 50 percent off because i really want your friends to join too so tell your friends and it's basically a two for one deal so if you and your friend both sign up then you each get 50 percent off you just have to tell me who they who they are and they'll tell me who you are or just one person tells me who they refer to so if you refer like 10 of your friends, you still only save 50%, but all 10 of those friends also save 50%. So it's a really great deal and you should post it on all of your social media accounts and get 
all of your friends to join because it's going to be so fun. Also, if you go under the updates tab, that is the blog, and that's going to have the information about that deal that I just told you about. Um, it's It also has a survey, and there are other courses that you can take with Story Cadet. And if you take this survey, you can tell me about your interest in those other courses. You can tell me about um, what your budget is. There, are, with the cadet course, there are a lot of different pricing options. So you can customize your own course. If you want only want to pay for a query edit, that's $35, and you get a query edit from me. Um, if you just want the lesson five, you can just pay for that. If you want to pay for the entire package deal, you get a great deal on that. Anyway, if you look at the updates, there is a survey in the most recent post. And if you fill out the survey, then you can win a free tuition either to this course right now, the course that I'm talking about, the cadet course, or you can win free tuition for any updating, any upcoming courses like the recruit course, which is all about brainstorming, the boot course, which is all about drafting your story, and we're just gonna start from having a spark of an idea and ending with a first draft, and it's gonna be amazing. That is the boot course, and there's also the ranger course, and the ranger course is me showing you how to revise your novel or graphic novel or story. So that's got a workbook with it, and we'll go through your entire story, and you'll get critique partners, and I will walk you through edits, and I will even do a line edit for you. So those are the options. I'm really excited about all of them. And of course, you can sign up for the Writer Reveille, a weekly digest for brainstorming, drafting, revising, pitching, and publishing stories. The first one is already up, and the next one is coming out Friday, and that will also have the recording of this lesson. And it will probably have the recording for the second lesson, too. Just saying. So sign up for that. And I think we're basically done. So I hope you sign up for the newsletter. Oh, my goodness. Stop screen sharing. OK. That was fun. It was like a vortex that we just went into. So. Um, I hope to see you next week. Hopefully I'll have some better lighting. We will be at the original time, which is 8 o'clock Central Time, my time, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. And if that doesn't work out for you, you should totally fill out the survey and say what times do work for you. And then future courses, I can actually hopefully work in your schedule so you can follow the live sessions and ask the questions. Anyway, thank you so much for joining this first lesson. It was kind of an experiment and an hour late, but um, I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, tweet Story Cadet. You can also tweet Lara Edits. Um, but if it's about one of these lessons, it, I would get a response to you a lot quicker if you tweet at Stora, Story, <laughs> at Story Cadet, not at Lara Edits. Okay, hope to see you on the interwebs. Have a great week, and hopefully I'll also see you in your inbox on Friday because you all signed up for Writer Reveille. All right, have a good week.